I used to work at a motel that everyone said was haunted. I must have been there for maybe six or seven months, and I hadn't seen anything of the sort. Granted, I don't believe in any of that kind of stuff, so it's not like I was out there with my spooko leader, but one night I had a little run-in with someone that had me questioning my stance on the supernatural altogether. So at this particular motel, we had what was basically an on-site diner that was just across from the rooms and everything a single story. One afternoon, we were expecting two elderly sisters to check in for a few nights. These two sisters just so happened to be friends of the owners and fairly regular guests who came to stay on the owner's dime maybe two or three times a year. Only, I hadn't met them yet, so I had no idea what they looked like or anything. It was way past dark when they arrived, so while they're being greeted by the owner and their baggage is being unloaded by some of the other staff, I get the nod to head up to their room with a bottle of complimentary wine. So I head to the bar and the on-site diner, grab a bottle of our best wine, two glasses and a tray, then head out of the back door of the diner and around to the back of the motel. This is a pretty crucial part of the story as I've been told the wine had to be a surprise. They'd never have accepted it otherwise and the owner wanted a little showmanship for his friends or, more accurately, to make it look like he bothered to put some effort into it prior to their arrival. Either way, it meant that I didn't see the old ladies arrive. Otherwise, this story basically would never have happened. There's basically no one else around and right after I put the wine into the motel room, I head out intending on scurrying away from the room to let the ladies don't catch me having planted their little diff. Only, the opposite way I was due to head, I noticed where the hallway lights was flickering. I swear to God, it was seriously like something out of a horror movie because I turned to look and underneath the flickering light, wearing a long, flowing dress, is a headless figure. At this point, it's important to note something about this whole dumb story of the ghost haunting the motel. Legend has it that it was a hung woman whose body had gone undiscovered for so long that she'd rotted to the point where her neck basically tore apart from the rot and the strain. Therefore, it was a headless ghost that was haunting the motel. I know that's about the lamest ghost story you've ever heard of, right? But then imagine being me, seeing that headless figure standing under the flickering light, and you can imagine why my heart went from 0 to 60 as I looked at something that I had absolutely zero explanation for. I think I gasped so loud and so much that my lungs felt like they were about to burst, and that caused the figure in front of me to turn around. Okay, it wasn't a ghost, like I said, there's no such thing as ghosts or spirits or anything of that nature. But there is such a thing as osteoporosis. Osteoporosis is a condition that severely weakens the bones of people who suffer with it. And in older folks, it can mean that they end up with some pretty painful hunching postures, or in this old lady's case, bones so weak that she could barely support her own head. This meant that from behind, it basically looked like this poor old lady had no head at all. Anyway, she turns around, gives me this look as if she'd horribly been offended by my terrified gas, and I'm forced to explain it away like, Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't see you. You startled me. She just frowns, points up at the light, and says something snarky like, Better get that fixed, young man. Then waddles off along the corridor. I felt like a total idiot. I seriously thought that I was looking at the very same ghost whose existence I've been denying for months on end. I can't even lie. It was one of the scariest and creepiest moments I think I've ever experienced. It all started when I woke up to the sound of someone hammering on my apartment door. That was the first fright I got that night. Heart pounding in my chest as I grabbed the bat I kept under my bed and headed towards the door. First thing I do is look through the peephole to make sure it's not anyone sketchy, but I'm greeted by the sight of one of my neighbors. She looks terrified. She's covered in blood and I can see just through the peephole that her face is a mess. I open up the door. She runs inside and immediately says, You gotta get me out of here? My boyfriend's trying to kill me. I start to ask her what happened, and she says something like, There's no time. Just please get me out of here. I swear to God, they'll kill you too for just helping me. That was what sent me into a straight up panic, because if a guy was willing to beat his girlfriend up that badly, Lord knows that he'd be willing to put me into the ground. I just grabbed my car keys, ran downstairs with the girl following close behind, jumped into my car, then took off into the night. I remember asking her if she had anywhere I could take her, like a friend's or a relative's or something. She said no, and the best thing for us to do would be to drive to a motel so she could call the cops from there. So that's exactly what I did. I drove us to a motel and booked us a room. The clerk was obviously just as concerned as I was, but all it took was to explain that her boyfriend had tried to offer, and they were like, geez, make sure you guys call the cops at least. The girl, whose name I didn't know at that point, 
I just knew she was a neighbor's. Said that she'd go up to the room and call them, then asked me to get her some ice from the ice machine so she could deal with the swelling on her face. When I got to the room, she said the cops would be there ASAP. Took the ice, put it on her face, then just burst into tears. I tried my best to reassure her, telling her she was safe and stuff. Then when she finally calmed down, I asked her what actually happened back at her apartment. She told me her boyfriend was abusive and that she'd been planning on leaving for a while. But that night was the night she'd finally got the courage to gather to announce it to him. She said he walked into their bedroom to find her packing a bag. And not long after that, everything went to chaos. She started helping herself to the little bottle of liquor from the minibar, but not after promising she'd pay me back for them once everything had blown over. I had no reason to disbelieve her at the time. I mean, I felt like we had a kind of bond established already, but I'd abstained because I thought I'd be driving back to the department pretty soon. I asked her if she was good to wait on her own while the cops drove out to her, but she'd asked me if I'd stay to keep her safe. She then made the point that if her boyfriend found the blood on my apartment door, she assured me that she'd left someone there while hammering on it, that he'd know she'd been there, and he'd try to attack me, or worse. I'll be honest, I thought it was a pretty good point at the time. I hadn't seen the blood myself, but she was so covered in it that I believed her when she said that there was someone on my door. Anyway, about an hour goes by and the cops still haven't showed up, and the motel rooms were arranged in a horseshoe shape, so we'd have seen them rolling into the parking lot if they had. I asked her to call them back to see what was going on, because obviously it was a really urgent situation, and I know that there was basically no way for the boyfriend in finding us, but I was still really paranoid that he would somehow. That's when the inconsistency started because she gave me some lame duck of a reply like, I'm sure they'll be here soon. If that was me, I'd have called 911. Again, if they hadn't shown up within like 10 minutes. So what was she so calm about that she was just cool with waiting for them for like an hour at that point? I put it down to booze. And at that point, I was okay with waiting too. It wasn't like I had anywhere to be. I sure couldn't just go back to my apartment with that cycle, supposedly just a few doors down. But that's also about the same time that I started checking out the amount of blood on her nightshirt. She had like an oversized shirt and girl boxers on. And like I said earlier, they were drenched with blood, but also with some blood splattered too, like little spots here and there. She had this cut over her eye, and she had a nasty busted lip, but it looked like way too much blood for just those small wounds. So I asked her if she had any other kind of injuries, like an abdominal wound of some kind that might account for all the blood on her. She said no, and that it was all from the busted lip in her eye, and immediately I start smelling nonsense. I asked her again what exactly had happened back at the apartment, and she started getting weirdly defensive about what she told me. I was starting to think it wasn't quite the abusive spouse kind of story that she told me the first time around, but I had no inkling of what was really going on. That being said, I was getting tired of waiting for the cops to show, so I decided to call them back myself. All I had on me was my wallet, my phone, and my car keys, the only three things I'd had time to stuff into the pockets of my shorts before fleeing the apartment. But when I take my phone not to call the cops, she says something along the lines of, I state the obvious, I'm about to call the cops back. Then she's like, don't. I don't know if it was the way she was looking at me, the way she spoke, or the way she sort of tensed up when I told her that I was about to do that. But the mood in the room just shifted completely. I asked her why not, and just went right back to dialing 911. But by the time the operator spoke down the line, I looked up and saw she had a knife in her hand. She just said, hang up now. So I did. I'd never had a knife pulled on me at that point, and I can't overstate how terrifying it was. It wasn't even just the knife either. It was the overwhelming creepy sensation of knowing that all wasn't what it seemed. I wasn't hiding from the threat. I was with the threat. I'll be honest here, I basically begged her not to hurt me, and to my relief, she said she wouldn't as long as I drove her to the Canadian border. Given this was in Detroit, the border isn't all that far, but I didn't want to catch charges for aiding and abetting or whatever so I knew I had to think of something to stop that from happening. It's not like I knew I couldn't tell the cops that I'd been threatened or whatever, but I also knew that the longer I'd spent in this girl's company, the more chances I'd have of being stabbed. So I tell the girl that I'd drive her to the border, that I needed to get something to eat first. I played like I wanted to stop somewhere on the way, knowing she reasoned me down to getting something delivered from a 24-hour joint. She also stated that she'd be the one going down to pick the food up, as she didn't want me having the chance to sound the alarm. That's where she messed up, because she didn't seem to realize, to my infinite relief, that I could order from DoorDash and put something in the notes about meeting the cops called to the motel. 
My whole plan hinged on there being a driver around that late at night. But thank God there was, and I was even able to show her the order without bringing up the notes section that mentioned needing 911. Called to the motel. And the cops played it perfectly too. They showed up without any lights and sirens on, then parked in the lot. Walked up to the motel room without being spotted from the window, then just knocked on the door like they were a delivery driver. She walks over, opens up the door, then boom. They had a gun and a taser drawn on her before she even knew what was happening. She had the knife tucked into the back of her girl boxers, but the cops were wise to her drawing on them, and she hit the floor hard after they hit her with a taser. Turned out they'd been looking for her because, get this, she was the abusive partner who'd stabbed her boyfriend almost to death before finding some poor schmuck, Ely, to drive her to the border. Dude almost bullet to death in their apartment but managed to crawl to another neighbor's place to get help. You should have seen the amount of blood in the hallway when I got back to my apartment building and the whole place was crawling with cops and forensic gear. I thought I might be able to drive over to a friend's place to stay the night, you know, contaminating the crime scene or whatever, but they had this section of the corridor closed off so I could actually get into where I lived. The cops came to my apartment in the morning to take my statement down and to fill me in on what they thought had happened. That's how I found out exactly what the deal was. It was 100% the craziest, most frightening thing that's ever happened to me ever in my life, and just the fact that I was part of it seems completely surreal to me. But the thing that sticks with Lee is how easily I swallowed her nonsense story at first, how I thought it was helping someone I knew, someone I could trust, when in reality, one wrong move, and I might not actually be around to tell you this. When I was about 19 or so, I got my first ever real job working at a gas station during the spring. It wasn't the best paying job, but it was enough to get my foot through the door to start making payments for college and stuff. I lived by myself in a small one bedroom apartment that my parents paid for. I got the job in the lean time to cover other expenses. My managers, being the jerks that they were, gave me a week of night shifts knowing I had a 7 a.m. class every morning. It was annoying to say the least, but I really needed the money. During the night shift, you'd have people constantly come in and out for gas at right around the 10 p.m. mark. Business would be slow for the most part. After that, you'd maybe have one or two shitty people come in once an hour for a snack with cigarettes. That being said, it's still a pretty good time where I could chill out for a few hours. One night, I was on my shift as usual and had just finished serving what I thought was the last customer for the night as I was about to end my shift. As I'm packing up and getting ready to leave, a car pulls up right in front of the store and a man gets out. He wore a stained white shirt and had a scruffy beard with messy hair. He walks right in and I greet him with a hello and asked if I could help him with anything. He completely ignores my question and walks over to the refrigerators and grabs a six pack of beer. I live in the south, so people like this were very common around here. I tell him his total and he then says something that made my skin crawl. Hey, you're really pretty. I love your hair. Laughing awkwardly, I tell him thanks and he proceeds to hand me a ten dollars bill making sure our hands touched. I give him his change and tell him to have a good rest of his night and go on my phone, hoping he'd get the hint to leave me alone. He thankfully left and I waited for my coworker who was working after me to arrive so I could go home. However, he must have been running late because it was 10 minutes past his shift and I was getting a bit annoyed. 10 minutes turned into 20 and then eventually 30. As I was about to call him to see where he was, I then noticed someone hiding behind one of the gas pumps. It was a little hard to see, but because of the light, I could make it out to be the same man from earlier. I had no idea as to what he was doing, but I could tell that it clearly wasn't good. He then comes out from behind the pump, and I see that he's clearly hiding something behind his back, and I wasn't going to stick around to find out. I grabbed my keys and was headed out toward my car when I see him approach the front door giving me this unsettling look. It was a look of hatred and fury. Suddenly, he pulls out a gun and proceeds to show it to me as if he wanted me to know that he was armed. At this point, I'm frantically dialing 911 on my phone and he then shoots the lock and steps inside yelling at me while having me at gunpoint. He orders me to give him all the money in the register or he won't hesitate to pull the trigger. I take a few deep breaths and calmly hand him the money we had and he then takes off down the road. I call the police while bawling my eyes out in fear and the operator tells me to stay on the line with her until an officer arrived. Thankfully, the guy never made it too far as police had managed to track him down. Turns out, this guy was wanted for sexual assault and murder. His victims were two family members, one of them being his wife, one widower, and two gas station employees.
I was a 20-year-old female at the time, and I was just about to move out of my parents' house two weeks later. I was going to be moving in my apartment in the city. It was a Wednesday morning around 10 a.m. I was on a summer vacation, and I was off from work that day, so I was still in bed. My parents had left for work earlier that day. Back then, my room was in the basement, and my window was right next to the stairs leading to the front door. I was woken up by the sound of someone walking up the stairs, and I thought it was odd, so I got up. I took my phone, and I went upstairs to try and get a better look at who this could be. Once upstairs, I saw from the kitchen window a man leaving our front yard and going back to the sidewalk. I was very relieved, and I thought it was probably just someone selling stuff. But then the man turned around, went back into our front yard, and started walking toward the right side of our house where there was a door leading to the kitchen, right where I was standing. The man then knocked, and he had asked if there was someone home. Looking back, I should have said yes through the window, but I was so scared and confused that I didn't say anything back. He then walked back to the front yard and back on the sidewalk and started walking away again. I was relieved, and I then told myself that maybe it was just a friend of my dad's that I didn't know, and that maybe he was looking for him. This didn't seem right, but I was trying to find any reason for this man to be there other than wanting to break in. Just when I thought the man had left, I saw him come back yet again and walk to the left side of my house towards the backyard. Now I was very scared at this point, and I knew he wanted to get in. I go to the front door, unlock it, and I waited for a couple of seconds. I then start to hear something cutting off the screen of my parents' bedroom window, and at that point I'm literally shaking. I opened the front door quietly and ran out of the house, calling 911. Within about five minutes, the police arrived, but unfortunately, the guy had ran away, and they never did end up catching him. Needless to say, I was terrified my first three months alone in my first apartment.